Hello everybody, I thought I'd take some time this week to tell you about our solar installation. Uh, run you through all of the steps that you'll need to follow to get your solar installed and tell you what we did on our installation. So let's get straight to it. The first thing that you'll need to do is you'll need to find your solar panels. But you'll come up with the question, well how many solar panels do I need? So you have to start with a little bit of maths. Go through every item that you think you'll run on a day-to-day -day basis and write them down in an Excel spreadsheet. Once you have them all written down, go on the internet and try and find out how many watts that item will use. Sometimes it'll be written on the back of the item uh, and you can go off that. Sometimes you might have to find it on the internet and if you can't find it on the internet you might have to buy a watt testing meter. We started off and because we work at home um, one of the main things that we'll be running is two laptops every day. We'll also be running a double A plus fridge. Uh, these are the highest used items in our system. We decided to go with gas for our cooker and our stove. Um, this gets another huge energy um, draw off the electric uh, solar system. So for us, we started at the beginning with our laptops. This is something that we need every day to do work. Um, because we want to be entirely off the grid, uh, we need to make sure that the solar system can handle everything that we're throwing at it. So we have two laptops. Uh, we noticed on the chargers that they run at about 90 watts uh, of energy. And it generally takes three hours to charge each laptop each day, and then it will run for five. So our eight hour day of battery generally uses three hours of charge time. Is what we worked out so that's six hours at 95 watts so we need 600 watts just to power our laptops and um, the fridge was the next highest draw um, the fridge is a double a plus fridge which is quite energy efficient and it's quite small so fortunately it's not using that much energy every day i think each year it uses 150 kilowatt hours so if yeah you get that down it, it's basically drawing again about another six to eight hundred watts a day I think from memory. Uh, you do that for every item so you think about how many lights you have in your house again we don't have many here are they energy saving bulbs yes they are so they're five watts each um, do you have any uh, heaters or anything that use electricity for us we decided that all of our heat uh, and cooking would come from gas so we have propane um, and butane heaters uh, slash gas stoves. Once you have all that energy worked out you'll realize how much solar energy you need per, per day um, and then you have to work out how much energy you can get from the sun each day so you can go online and you can find a uh, estimator that will tell you how many hours of sunlight you get um, on your land per day. So fortunately for us we're in the southern Algarve so we get quite a lot of sun and it's quite blue skies most of the time. So working back from where how much we needed versus how many hours of sunlight we had per day, we estimated that we would need roughly about six, 700 watts. Um, we knew that the panels were never going to be entirely clean the whole time and we knew that we weren't going to be tracking the sun perfectly. Um, they were just going to be on the roof of the house and mounted directly to it at that. So we thought we'll add a buffer of about 30% on top. So if we needed 600 watts, we went for 800 watts worth of panels. We managed to find two uh, very high efficiency panels um, at 400 watts each that we could link together for our 12 volt system. We decided to go off 12 volts because we wanted some water pumps to work on our system around 12 volts and generally we were just trying to keep things cheap. Um, Later on we'll talk about batteries and there the batteries that we were looking at for the energy density 12 volt made the most sense. So once you've got your solar panels you need to mount them to the roof. We bought a kit with our solar panels um, that had the rails that just snapped straight together and it also had mounting brackets that we could mount them direct to our roof. Fortunately we have a aluminium uh, roof uh, with wooden beams underneath. So basically we just use some silicon, some mounting tape uh, and the brackets on top to mount directly into the wooden roof joists that we had in the caravan. That's made a really secure seal and there's no way that water can get in there. So once you have your solar panels purchased and installed, the next thing that you'll be needing 
is a solar charge controller or an MPPT. A charge controller basically helps to make sure that the voltage is right for your batteries to charge it optimally all of the time. And an MPPT is just a better form of charge controller. Basically, the sun, as it shines in different intensities throughout the day, um, creates a different voltage output from your panels all day. Just because they're 12 volt batteries doesn't mean that they produce 12 volts. In fact, it's usually quite a lot higher than that. So what a charge controller does is it modulates the, the voltage to create a solid, consistent voltage that you need for charging your batteries all day long. Um, and then it ups the current or lowers the current to match that to get the most out of the sunlight that's available at the time. Now an MPPT can also help by um, adjusting to the different phase cycles of your battery to ensure that your battery uh, has the right amount of uh, current and voltage throughout the day to, to maximise the life of that battery and you know, optimise charging times etc. So we opted for a nice um, kind of an expensive charge controller to be honest from Victron Energy. Um, it's a German company, they're quite iconic for their blue gear. But, you know, to be honest, the charge control is one of those things that we felt was worth it, you know, to help make sure we get the most energy out of our panels and to make sure that we maximise the life of our batteries, it was worth the investment. Plus, to be honest, the resale value of those kind of holds. Um, so if in future we ever want to sell this, we, we felt that we could sell them. They're kind of the apple of uh, the charge controller world. So, we opted for the Victron 150 uh, model of MPPT. That means that you can have 100 volts and 50 amps. Now you'll be thinking, those of you who are quick at maths, well hang on, you've got 800 watts at 12 volts. That's more than uh, 50 amps. But like I mentioned earlier on, we don't expect to really ever get that. And when we do get over that amount, it'll just dump that as heat. So we've oversized our solar panels for our system, but the MPPT can make the most out of it. And it didn't make sense to step up just for those few days when we may get over that in terms of um, solar capacity. So far, that um, kind of guess on my side has paid off. Um, we haven't really had more than uh, 600 watts uh, of output energy, given that our uh, mobile home isn't perfectly aligned. So it worked out okay, and maybe again we can adjust that later on in the winter and get more power. In terms of batteries, that's the next thing you'll be needing to do once you've got your MPPT. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we've gone with a 12 volt system, so we purchased two 6 volt, 600 amp hour batteries, and we put them in series. Now series means that it keeps the same amp hours but doubles the voltage, so two 6 volt batteries in series is 12 volts. If you were to put them in parallel, that means positive to positive, negative to negative, then that would mean that you only had 6 volts of energy, but you are having 1200 amp hours. A little bit of electricity calculations there for you. But ours is basically just in series, so our two 6 volt batteries add up to being 12 volts and we get 600 amp hours. That is a lot of power. Um, our batteries are rated to drop um, regularly 50% and recharge so you don't get to use the whole 600 amp hours and the 600 amp hours is drawing the energy very slowly so be aware of that when you're doing these calculations you really have to look at the spec sheets but you know we can hope to get regularly about 200 to 300 max amps out of amp hours out of our system at 12 volts and to be honest we should probably try and aim for the 200 so looking at the, the usage that we need in our system that's about that's what we calculated and um, we decided to you know invest 850 amp hours in battery to make sure that we had um, a decent cycle there now i would love to have invested in lithium batteries but they are a lot more expensive i think for you know again if we're looking for around 200 300 usable amp hours of battery then lithium would have cost you know a lot more than that even for the cheapest you know 50 to 100 percent more um, and for us, this is uh, somewhere where we're going to live for a year or two max while we build the house. And the resale value of batteries really isn't very high. As well, battery technology is increasing all the time and you can't mix and match battery technologies. So again, it's not like we could use these in the house when we moved in there later on. It's something for sure that's going to get sold with the caravan. And I just don't think that the money will be there in the resale value. So we decided to go with them and to try and look after them as long as possible. 
these flooded lead acid batteries that we went for um, are rated to last for 30 years but it's 30 years in ideal conditions, ideal temperatures, um, minimum usage, really light conditions. So ours, I expect them to last for five to 10 years. Um, and we're gonna try and look after them to get them to the 10 years. But to be honest with the extreme weather that we have here, I'm not sure if that's possible, but at 800 euros, I'm not gonna be uh, too upset if, you know, if for whatever reason we get to five years and we still have this battery system. So after you have your batteries installed, you'll need to get your inverter. Now we have our inverter sat here. It's a 12 volt, 3000 watt, 6000 watt inverter. Now, when you look at inverters, you'll see that mentioned quite a lot, these two numbers and you're like, what does that mean? Well, basically the first number 3000 watts is how much it is rated for um, continuously. So how much can you draw from it continuously? The next number, 6,000, is how much can you get at peak for a very short amount of time. And that's because certain motors and heaters, uh, well, most motors and heaters, when they start up, they take, they suck a lot of current to get started. Um, and that means that you need a lot of wattage. So you have to look at those peak loads when you're calculating what kind of inverter you need. So for us, the fridge is the big peak load. And also, Hannah has a very fancy blender um, that she really likes that can take up to 2000 watts on its highest setting when we measured it so that meant that we we needed to look at an inverter that could take with our load the reason why we decided to go for 3000 watts 6000 watts you know we could have honestly got by on 900 watts is what we calculated if we didn't use the blender um, and originally that's what we planned but because of the temperatures um, when we were looking at our original inverter the fans were going to be on all the time. We we're going to be taking 900, 900 watts continuously of the thousand, and it's the temperatures here where it's stored uh, regularly go 35, 40 degrees in the summer. So we thought that's probably not going to be the best for the little inverter. So by going to a bigger inverter that wasn't much more money, we knew that this had the capacity to handle um, higher draws, therefore higher heats um, continuously um, without the fans having to come on. So we decided to go that way. Also, another part that was in the back of my head was thinking that I might want to get some um, electric tools that aren't battery powered in future, such as a table saw. Uh, and this will come in really handy for that. So one other important thing, when you're buying your inverter, you need to make sure that you're buying a pure sine wave inverter because they come in two different flavors. A pure sine wave is needed to run lots of motors, basically. So things like fans, water pumps, they, they all need this pure sine wave to operate correctly. Pure sine waves are generally the one that's more expensive, but um, have a look when you're buying and ensure you get a pure sine wave inverter. After you have your inverter sorted, you want to think about the 12 volt side of your system. For us, we had uh, two 12 volt pumps that we're using. We have a submersible bump in the well that pumps water up into a small tank and is triggered by a floating switch that turns it off and on. We also have a diaphragm pump mounted under the caravan. It takes uh, water whenever it's needed, whenever a tap turns on, the pressure switch senses that the water is coming out and that the pressure has dropped. So it turns on and pumps it from the tank. So that's kind of the on-demand pump that we have. And we decided to go for 12 volt of them because they're very energy efficient models. Um, and we didn't want to use too much power. So both of those, if there was to be a problem, if the water was to leak or a switch was to break, they would constantly keep on pumping. They could draw down all the energy from our battery. And now, as I mentioned earlier on, you don't really want to go below 50% of these batteries. If you were to go down to 10%, zero, you'd never get that charge back. The batteries would be done for. And really, if you were to go down to 20, 30, you'd, you'd do lasting damage to the batteries. So we got a device called from Victron again called uh, Battery Protect. And what this does is it has a little siren that goes off uh, when the voltage gets too low and then eventually it will cut off um, those motors from using 
battery power when it gets too low. The inverter that we have, both inverters that we bought, uh, actually have those built into them as well. So we don't need to run the inverter through there, which means that we get a cheaper model that doesn't need to go have such high amperage. And that helps offset the costs a little bit. But we think that's a really valuable device to have because yeah, the batteries are one of the biggest expenses you'll have in this and it's worth spending the extra to protect them. Speaking of battery protection, the next thing that you'll need to get is a Bluetooth sensor for your Victron MPPT. This is a Bluetooth temperature sensor that you can mount on the side of your battery and it helps constantly tell the MPPT what temperature the batteries are at so that it can adjust the amount of voltage that it gives them. If your batteries are hot, they can overcharge and when you overcharge you can also do lasting damage to them so it's really important if you're in these temperate climates you know and it's very very hot you need to make sure that you have one of these to maximize the life of those batteries so it's only i think ours we got our second hand for 40 euros you know for helping ensure that batteries last uh you know twice as long i think that's that's a worthwhile purchase Okay, after you've bought all of the main pieces of items, you'll need to get onto the smaller items. So fuses and circuit breakers is the next step. We've got four different types of fuses in our system. Originally, we bought circuit breaker to um, go in between the MPPT and the batteries, but it was triggering too low. Generally, you want to get a circuit breaker that's 20% above the amperage that's going to be drawn through. But because this circuit breaker was maybe a little bit cheap, it was only 25 euros, it was triggering too low in the heat because it's a thermoelectric one. So that wasn't good. And it meant that every now and again, it'd trip and the solar would not charge you up, which is really, you know, again, it can be catastrophic if you don't notice that for two days on our system. So we've decided to swap that for a 60 amp uh, fuse that you can get from any kind of electronics, auto electronics shop. It's quite often used to um, go in the line when you have a high um, sound system in your car. We decided to have a circuit breaker of 300 amps in between the battery and the inverter. Again, the inverter could have taken more amps from this, but we, we're never going to take that use. So we wanted to cap it at 300 amps. The circuit breaker sits in between the batteries and the inverter. And if the inverter wants to suck more energy or there's a short or anything, then that will just shut down and ensure that no um, damage can be done to the inverter or the batteries. The next type that we have is the circuit breakers that are in the house. This is just generally what you would have if you were on a grid system. We have a circuit breaker box inside there uh, that has each of the rooms and the lights um, on individual circuit breakers. Now this box just runs through with a wire into the inputs of our inverter. Uh, you need to make sure that that wire that you're using can take the amperage um, at the 230 volts. So I think we have a two millimeter um, squared copper wire running between the inverter and there to make sure that we can use that if we're using all of our devices at the same time. The next fuses are the fuses in between the, the pumps at 12 volts and the battery protect. This is again just to make sure if there's any circuit, um, short circuit there, it doesn't damage the entire system. So there, because it's 12 volts, we can just use a car circuit box um, that you can get for RVs or for, again, car modifications and just the simple blade fuses that stick in there. They're quite cheap and effective and work really, really well. Once you've done your fuses, you need to get your wire sorting. Now, wire comes in Europe in millimeter squared measurements. That's the thick, how much copper surface area that you have. And in the US, that's measured in AWGs. You really have to be careful here because if you mess this up, you can cause fires and burn down your house. So it's really important for safety to make sure that you have the right gauge wire. You need to ensure that you are, when you are wiring up your system, you use all of the copper and that the copper has the right surface area for your wire. So the largest, because we're using 300 amps uh, maximum that can go through our system um, from the inverter, we made sure that we have 35 millimeter squared cable running through. And now what, when you're wiring this up, you need to make sure that your lugs are crimped onto all of the wire. Make sure that you haven't accidentally cut some of your wire or you're not crimping half of it or you're not tying it in correctly. Because if you don't, then you won't use all of the wire. And that means that extra current will be flowing through those wires and that can is where it starts to get hot 
and the resistance basically creates heat which can melt the uh, insulation and set fire to it. If you want to find these, you can find these uh, online, like what size wire you will need. Um, you just need to know the current that's going to be flowing through your wire. If you go to an electric shop, they should be help guide you and sometimes you can see um, the amperage rated on the side of the wire itself to let you know where it can go through. Um, and the insulation does kind of matter there as well. So all of our wire is gauged to the system correctly. We have 22 millimeter um, copper wire going from the MPPT to the batteries to ensure that that 60 watts has more than enough. Uh, we have 35 millimeter squared wire going from the batteries to the inverter. And then from the inverter, like I said, to inside the caravan, we have two millimeter square copper wire to make sure that it can carry the current there. Any other wiring that we have, um, such as the wire going from the solar panels, I think that is eight millimeter squared. Um, and yeah, so that, that makes sure that all of the wires are still cool to the touch when we're grabbing them. Uh, they don't get hot and it ensures that they, um, again, have the least resistance possible. So it keeps your efficiency up on your whole system. So that was everything guys in our system. I hope you found that helpful and informative. Um, overall, it costs us around 2000 euros. We got most of the kit for 1800 euros, but we bought um, some pieces, like I mentioned, second hand, such as the Victron Battery Protect and the um, Smart Bluetooth Temperature Sensor uh, to add on to the system. Now, we did buy two inverters and I was gonna sell one second hand, uh, the cheaper 1000 watt inverter that we bought first. But now I'm in two minds, because what happened was that our large inverter had a manufacturer's default and we had to send it back for a warranty claim, but that left us without power, and without power we had no water. Now this could be catastrophic if you live off the grid, um, so I've learned how important it is with that to have backups, and I think I might keep it now because that's really good for a backup. That small cheap, you know, I think it was £250 um, for that inverter, it has a charge controller built in, and it can also take energy from the grid or from a generator and convert it. So this is really good for us because I think that if we have that as a spare, it means that we can last a long time without having to, while things get repaired. So if anything, the MPPT, charge controller, the inverter breaks, we could swap it out for this one and it can do the job uh, on its behalf at least to keep us going. Just Hannah won't be able to use her nice blender. Yeah, so that would be one of my pieces of advice really to anyone looking to do this. If you're really looking to go off grid, it'd be make sure that you have spare parts, have spare wires, maybe have some spare fuses, um, and also, yeah, look at getting, um, even if it's just a cheap inverter, like you can get 500 watt uh, inverters really quite cheap, or, you know, it doesn't have to be a sine wave inverter. Um, but just get an something that can help power your essentials that you need so you can charge your phone, uh, contact, get help, get on the internet, or, you know, get, get water pumped if you need it. Okay, folks, thank you for watching this video. I hope you found that informative. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and think about subscribing to our channel. Um, Till next time, thank you very much.